Hi, I'm Alex Sudris. Thanks for joining us for the third IFR Bold Method Live. Tonight, we're going to talk about DME Orcs. It's a tool that I think everybody's heard of and most of us have flown, uh, but these days, I think a lot of us are using GPS and that art of navigating an arc is starting to go away. But they're incredibly useful and they're actually very, very easy to fly. In fact, I think flying a DME arc is much easier than flying a procedure turn with or without a heading or attitude indicator. It's my preferred way to get onto a procedure if I have the option. So tonight we're gonna to take a look at some of their uses. We all know about the initial approach segment DME arc. We're gonna take a look at other cases where you'll see them happen. We'll talk about how to lead your turn onto an arc and how to lead your turn off of an arc. And we'll also talk about how to navigate an arc. And we're gonna look at it using traditional HSI or VOR based navigation, the bearing pointer, which is more available now than it was before. And we'll talk about GPS as well. So let's start by taking a look at where you can find some DME arcs. And let's jump to the iPad where I've got four flight open. And we're gonna to go to Medford, Rogue Valley International in Southern Oregon. It's a mountainous town. And you can see this right here is the Brute 7 IFR departure procedure. And you can see it's based off of a DME arc. So in this case, when departing the airport, you're gonna join the 066 radial to Saros, and then depending on your transition, you're either gonna arc north, or if you're headed south, you'll arc south. And we've flown this procedure before. In fact, we took it when we were departing Medford. It's, it's their standard departure procedure. We took it all the way here to Uhizi and Morn and headed off back to, uh, I think we're headed to Eugene there. So it's a typical departure procedure. If you're flying out of the airport in IFR conditions, you're gonna get this. And you can also see they've got another one uh, arcing the other direction. That's the NATS 7 arc departure procedure. But it's not just on departure procedures and initial approach segments. You'll also find arcs, rarely, is the entire approach. So this is the VOR to DME runway 15 in Martin State Airport, just outside of Baltimore near Maryland. And if you take a look at it, the entire procedure is based off of an arc. It starts at slope right here, the initial approach fix, and you follow the 14.7 DME arc all the way around to the missed approach point, radial 060 for the Baltimore VOR. And if you go missed, you'll track inbound on the 068 radial and intercept the 11 DME arc and take that to your, uh, your, missed, appro or your missed approach holding fix. So this entire procedure is based off of a DME arc. And we've also, the advantage of all these is if you have GPS, you can use your GPS to guide you along the arc. That's something that you can always do. If you don't have GPS, if you're just flying with DME, you've got to fly it the traditional way. But even with a GPS equipped aircraft, even with something like a brand new G1000 NXI, there are some cases where you're going to need to manually fly an arc. And that's when you're flying an unpublished arc because there's no way to program that arc into your GPS system. So when would you fly an unpublished arc? when ATC gives you one. And a good example, back in the 90s when I was teaching at the University of North Dakota, it was an IFR day, we had a bunch of aircraft in the air. It's one of those warm days, so everybody wanted to get out and get some time. Approach control is provided by Grand Forks Air Force Base, and it's about five o'clock at night. Um, next thing you know, they lost all of their radar. It's not that the radar went out, it's that their scopes lost connection. So all of the controllers couldn't see any of our aircraft, and it was IMC. Center couldn't take over. I don't think they could see it either. So basically, ATC had to control us without any radar. And interesting experience, what they did is they asked us to report a radial. We track our radials. We tracked outbound on those radials until we intercepted an arc that they gave us. And then they told us to arc to the south or the southwest or in different directions. And by knowing which radial we were on and then getting us onto an arc and putting us at all the same airspeed, everybody was flying 100 knots, they could space out all of the aircraft without using radar. So that's a case where you get an arc and you didn't even see it. And the interesting thing about that is when you start getting into the IFR system, there's a lot of things that you won't get very often. Non-published random holds or DME arcs that don't appear on a chart. And you can't necessarily plug them into your flight plan and just make the airplane fly them. So you still need to know how to fly them by hand. And the reality is when they give them to you, it usually means ATC is overloaded. So they really need you 
to fly that procedure. So that's why maintaining this proficiency, being able to fly a DME arc without just using the GPS centered needle to navigate the entire procedure, that's why this is definitely an important technique. Okay, so for all of tonight's examples, we're gonna to cut to the iPad and I'll show you uh, the approach that we're gonna use. We're gonna be focused on the ILS to runway four in North Bend. So North Bend's right on the coast of Oregon. It's one of the places we've been filming for the instrument approach or the instrument course. And it's got a large DME arc. It's 135 degrees. You can see it on this Jepson plate. They kind of um, cut off the beginning, but it arcs down both from the north and then up from the south. And it lines you up with the localizer. The interesting thing about this procedure is that the DME and the arc information, sorry, is provided by this offset VOR. It's not the same as the localizer. So you can't, um, you can't fly, you. that VOR radio won't line up with the localizer path on the way in, they're different. Okay, so let's take a look at that in an FAA plate. You can see on the FAA plate, they show the entire arc. So if we're coming from the north, we intercept the arc at rares. We arc 135 degrees down until we intercept the localizer and then we head inbound. And it's the 16 DME arc. The advantage here is we can skip the procedure turn. If you look at a map, we've actually loaded up those points. So if we look to the north, you can see on Victor 287, rares is this fix right here. So if you're coming in on the Victor airway, rares gives you an easy way to transition from the in route environment to the procedure. And the same thing is true down here. Lupchi is the southern initial approach fix for the arc. And one of the neat things about ForeFlight, if you've never seen this before, you can click the share button up here and it'll add it to the map. And now you can see exactly how that Victor airway that we're on takes us right over rares and lines us perfectly up for the arc. So that's the example that we're gonna use. Okay, so to get into this, we're gonna talk about how to actually navigate a mark. We're gonna talk about how to lead your turn onto the arc. Assuming that you're intercepting at a 90 degree angle, that's the most common. Then we're gonna talk about how to navigate the arc itself with and without, or without and with wind. And then we're gonna talk about how to lead your turn from the arc onto the localizer, which again, is almost always a 90 degree turn. That's, that's fairly common. The interesting thing about the lead is you're generally doing two 90 degree turns. So the principles that you use to judge your lead are the exact same, your lead on, and your lead off. It's just kind of how you measure that different that distance that, that starts to change things up. And another thing to think about, in most newer aircraft, especially with the ADSB upgrades that are happening right now, almost everybody's getting their distance information from GPS. And so you would have it giving you distance, in this case, from, from the North Bend VOR. That's where the distance for the 16 DME arc that we're gonna look at today comes from. If you're using a DME, it's the exact same if you're using DME distance. There are actually a couple little things we'll talk about with DME that can give you hints that you're dead on the arc that you won't have with GPS, but ultimately, whether you're using your DME radio or a GPS, the technique of maintaining that arc is about the same. Okay, so let's start by looking at this. We're gonna shift back to the iPad. Let's take a look at this from a GPS perspective, the most common basic perspective. And we're gonna look at this as if we're flying with, with wind. So it's GPS with wind. As we come into the arc, the advantage of the GPS is it will automatically judge your lead onto the arc. And it's gonna start your turn whenever it feels like it's appropriate to get you perfectly established on the arc. And the interesting thing when you look at the GPS, is you can see when you're using GPS to navigate the arc, the entire time, you just keep the needle centered. Now you'll notice that what I'm doing is I'm cycling my heading bug. We're doing a counterclockwise or left arc today. And I'm just cycling my heading bug about 10 degrees left over and over again as I fly down the arc. But you'll also notice that I'm basically turning smoothly. And if you were to turn your aircraft on autopilot and allow the GPS to fly this arc, what you would find is that the airplane's sitting at about maybe a two degree bank to the left. And it's just in a constant turn as it flies around this arc. You'll also notice, let's go back to the beginning. I've got some wind. I'll pause this. I got some wind coming out of the south. It's uh, 165 degrees at 30 knots. 
The magnetic variation here is 15 east. So winds are, if you read it, it's true. You could say the winds are reported at, from 180 at 30. But when we convert that to magnetic, that's 165 at 30. And you'll notice that this little arrow, just like if you're, on a, if you're looking at a primary flight display, the arrow here in the bottom right corner of the screen, that's going to line up with where 165 is, actually right about here on the screen. So you can see how that affects our heading indicator as we go around. The neat thing about a GPS is it automatically figures your wind correction angle along the arc. And as you fly that arc, it's going to take that wind correction angle out as you start to turn into a headwind. It'll add it if it turns into more of a crosswind. All you need to do is keep the needle centered. So when we're talking about practicing an arc, I can tell you that the GPS is the worst way to practice an arc. Because if you're using the GPS to fly an arc, all you gotta do is keep the needle centered. Now that's also why when I'm just flying, I need to get in an IMC and I wanna transition and quickly get myself onto the approach, my favorite least workload way to do it is to set up that GPS driven DME arc and take it in. It's super smooth, less major turns in a procedure turn, much easier, more comfortable for passengers, gives me time along the arc to do a stable descent, set up brief things if I need to do any other briefing. It's really a great way to enter the approach. But of course the problem is, if we're just using the GPS, you can lose the ability to manual fly, manually fly it. And if you're ever given an unpublished arc or you need to fly an aircraft that doesn't have GPS and has DME, you've lost that skill. Okay, so let's take a look at a no-win scenario. We're gonna fly the same arc from rares around to the localizer. And we're gonna use a HSI, electronic HSI, and our bearing pointers. And we're gonna look at this in a no-win scenario. So we're gonna fly a perfect no-wind arc. Okay, so I'll load that up. Okay, so you can see we have a few steps here. First of all, let's take a look at the screen. You can see that I'm inbound on the 188 radial. That's in the top left corner of my HSI. I've got green needles, so I'm connected to my VOR. And you can see if we were to reverse that radial 008, it's the 188 bearing to the VOR. So I'm inbound here. In the top right corner of the HSI, you can see my ground speed, 120 knots. And in the bottom left here, you get some bearing information. This is pretty typical information you'll find with the newer G1000. You can see the distance right there. And then OTH 188. With the newer HSI systems, the G1000 NXIs, you'll get a bearing, not a radial. So it's not the radial you're on, it's your bearing inbound to the station, something to keep in mind. But this will all kind of be useful as we go through. You can see that we're gonna to have to figure out when to turn onto the arc. And there's a really easy tool for that based off your ground speed. You take 10% of your ground speed. So if we're going 120 knots, 120 equals 1.2. 120 times 0.1 is, or sorry, 1%, that's the word I was looking for. 0 0.01 equals 1.2. So we just draw a little period right in there. That's my lead in. We're gonna lead in by 1.2 miles. And when you're flying inbound on an arc, that's a very easy thing to do because you just have to look at your distance. We know we're on a 16 DME arc, so plus 1.2 equals 17.2 DME. That's when we'll start our turn. So let's watch that through. As we fly ourselves in, all we're doing is watching for our DME to get to the point where it's at 17. I'll fast forward this a little bit, or 17.2. Okay, so as we get to 17.2, now I need to start to set the airplane up for an arc. And I'm gonna use my HSI needle here to do this. My general principle when flying with an HSI is you always point the needle to the station. You don't fly a radial, you point the head to the station. That way when you're using an HSI, the course starts in front of you, where it really is, the radial you've selected, and you fly yourself through it, okay? The same thing is true with the VOR. 
Um, if you don't have an HSI, if you're using a fixed VOR, I typically start by pointing to. And the difference is you won't fly yourself to it. If you're arcing to the left or counterclockwise and you have a two, you'll find that when you're going left, if you're, if you're arcing left, it will swing left. So it'll start out on the right side and then swing to the left and vice versa for counterclockwise. But in this case, I'm gonna center up my HSI two. And the other thing is we're not flying a smooth circle anymore. If we're manually flying an arc, we're breaking it up into a whole bunch of small segments. And those segments, it's going to depend on the size of them. It's really up to you. I typically use 10 degree wide segments. So what I will do is I will spin my HSI until the deflection bar goes all the way out in front of me, okay, right at the edge. And then I will let it fly all the way through me just to the point it reaches the end. And I will twist the CDI again all the way to the point it's just out in front of me. So essentially, you'll, you'll hear this called twist 10 and then you'll turn 10 degrees of heading. So you're turning 10 degrees of arc each time. You're twisting the CDI 10 degrees and you're turning your heading 10 degrees. So let's take a look at this screen and you should be able to see that here. What you can see, if I fast forward in, is that these arc bits here are actually little straight segments that you can see here. And what we're gonna do is we're just flying tangential to the arc. We're just flying a little tangent and then we're gonna turn 10 degrees and fly another tangent and essentially just fly little segments along the arc. The radial that we're selecting is right in the middle of each of these segments. That's why we fly through it. So if you think about it on an HSI, I'm gonna rewind this back a little bit. I'm in the middle. What you can see is I'm on a segment there where I'm now right, because this is essentially centered, I have just flown through the radial. I'm gonna wait till it hits full scale deflection, and then I'm gonna turn it again. Okay, so let's watch this all the way from the point where we turn on the arc. So as I start my turn, the first thing I'm going to do is spin my CDI so that it comes full scale deflection. Once it does that, I've selected my radial. Now I'm going to turn to a heading that is basically perpendicular of this. And so you'll see me set my heading bug and I'm gonna make that right turn to join the arc. And fly that heading. And I'm gonna fly this heading along this first segment till right there, it's almost right at the end. I don't let it go all the way to the end, but I take it right about there. And then I'm going to twist, so you'll see, watch, the CDI is gonna twist left, because I'm turning left, I'm arcing left here. So I'll twist it, and I don't count at 10 degrees, I just wait till it hits full scale deflection, and now I'm gonna move my heading indicator, or my bug, 10 degrees, and turn 10 degrees left. And now I'm flying through. So if you were to measure this, right here, my radio is coming off the VOR right there. Okay, I start my segment here, I end my segment there. You can see it as the magenta line right there. And I'm now just going to fly the aircraft along that segment. I'm gonna get rid of the lines because they move. And so you can see now that I'm coming up on my radial. Boom, I've crossed my radial and I'll fly through it. Okay, so how do I know I'm actually on the arc? That's easy, my DME shouldn't change. PTS standards, I believe are one mile. Honestly, you should be able to fly an arc within a couple tenths um, once you get proficient, it's very easy to keep yourself on an arc. The wider the arc, the easier it is. But we know we're on the arc when that distance isn't changing, when we're on the published arc distance and it's not changing. So in the top right corner, you notice my ground speed on a GPS unit says 120. It's showing me my actual ground speed. And that's one of the differences between GPS and a traditional DME system. So if you've ever flown with a radio DME system, it doesn't know what direction you're going. It just knows how far you are from the station. It is completely independent of the VOR unit it's associated with. It could be tied to a VOR or an NDB or a, 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 or a uh, localizer, but it's not part of that unit. It's just another radio system placed at the same location. And so when you're flying a DME arc perfectly, your distance from the station will not change at all. And so your DME will think that you're going zero knots. So when you're flying on a traditional DME radio, you will see zero knots ground speed because it doesn't think you're getting any closer or further from the station, which is true. You're just flying a perfect arc around it. Okay, looks like we've got a question. 
And that question is about distance, Alex. So here's the question from my Kennedy. Uh, what's the difference between GPS and DME slant range distance? Okay, let's take a look at that. I'm gonna jump over to a scratch pad here in um, ForeFlight so that you can see that a little bit easier. So we'll jump open to a clean scratch pad. So essentially, when you look at a DME system, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna draw a really sloppy horizontal line. I'll try that again. Um, there you go. If you think about it, you got this VOR unit here, kind of looks like that. The DME portion is typically this cone, though it could be shaped differently. And what it does is it's gonna send some radio signals up to you right there, and you're gonna hear those and uh, timing-wise, figure out your distance. Basically, not like a transponder, but similar. By the way, DMEs actually have aircraft capacity. Most of them can only handle, I believe it's 199 aircraft at a time because it's got to measure each signal distinctly. And uh, there are some airports, some major airports, if you look at on the Jepson, in the, in Jepson plates or in the airport facility directory, they'll actually say, do not turn your DME on until you depart because you will overwhelm the DME units. So DME units can't handle infinite number of airplanes. But let's go back to this. If you look at that uh, iPad, you can see that it's not really measuring the horizontal distance across the ground. It's measuring this right here. And the reality is the further away you get from the station, the less that is an issue. We call that slant range error. The dis dis distance difference between here and here. GPS, on the other hand, it just looks at coordinates, latitude and longitude. So it really doesn't run into that problem. Um, and I think in, on an on a instrument procedure, certified distance, the two are entirely interchangeable. You really shouldn't notice much of a difference. So on a certified pr procedure, whether you're using DME or GPS, if you're using certified distances on there, the two are considered interchangeable. Okay, looks like we had another question. Nope, I just forgot to turn the light on. <laughs> we have a, you can't see it. We've got a green light that tells me when there's a question. So, um, so let's take a look at us back on the arc. I told you that DME will say that you are basically zero knots when you're perfectly on an arc. That's an old school way of knowing you're doing a good job. Uh, and I remember back in the 90s looking at DME and saying, he was, I would say one or two knots. I'm like, man, I'm really nailing it. Six or seven knots, I knew I was flying myself off the arc. GPS, you can't use that anymore. But there is something that's kind of interesting. Let's rewind this just for a second and you'll see it as we're going. I'm gonna go to the centered point, okay? you'll notice that I'm basically drawing a little T here, a perpendicular T, and this you do have on a GPS-driven HSI. You've got a ground track indicator, or a GTI, or ground vector, whatever you want to call it. When that is perpendicular to your radial, you are basically right parallel with the arc. And if this distance lines up, then you are dead on the arc. So again, if we're flying an arc, all we're doing is twisting 10, turning 10, flying through the arc. You can see perfectly perpendicular and twist 10, turn 10. And we just keep doing that all the way around the arc. Uh, this arc we've flown, it's 135 degrees of arc. And so when you think about that, that is a long distance to fly. It takes us quite a while. But we'll zoom our way through here. Let's talk about how we get off of the arc. So now you can see we're coming up to our localizer and we're gonna to need to lead this turn in. Our ground speed, no wind day, is still 120 knots. And we know that we lead a turn by 0 0.01 or 1 one hundredth, so 1.2, 1.2 miles. But the problem is, how do we know when we're 1.2 miles from that radio? Now I know there's a fix there, but it's also radial 233. How do you know when you're 1.2 miles from the 233 degree radial? And that comes down to one of the most useful rules in aviation, which is the 60 to one rule. And I know we use this for everything. We use it for climb and descent gradients. We use it for distance computations. Uh, if you're doing an interview, I think it's Delta. It could be FedEx. One of their favorite questions is they give you an arc and they say, well, how long is this arc? How, how far are you flying? And it's a quick little mental math question. The cool thing about it is we all have calculators in the airplane. So this gets a lot easier than it used to be. You could just sit there and punch this out in the calculator in the airplane and it's really easy to use. So the 60 to one rule basically says that a 60 mile arc, every degree is one nautical mile. 
So if you're flying a 60 DME arc and you move one degree, one radial, you've flown one nautical mile. Well, Chris, no one flies 60 mile arcs. So let's divide that by two, 30 DME arc. Okay, now one mile is two radials. Okay, 15 is half of that. One mile is four radials. 15 DME arc is just about the 16 DME arc, DME arc that we're flying here in North Bend. So if you wanted to get an idea of you know, how far a mile is in North Bend, it's about four degrees. If you pass four radials or four degrees in the VOR, you've flown one mile. And you can keep taking that down, seven and a half degree arc uh, or seven and a half DME arc, it's gonna be eight degrees per mile. So now we wanna lead our turn. And so we're gonna jump into a scratch pad again in four flight and I'll clear this out. Oops, sorry. We know that we wanna lead by 1.2 nautical miles, okay? And so if you think about that, we know, we're just gonna round it, do some mental math. A 15 nautical mile arc, it happens to be four degrees per nautical mile. Okay, so 1.2 is about 1.25. They're really, really close. So that would be five degrees. We need to lead our turn on by essentially five degrees. Okay, let's go back to the procedure. So we know that the arc ends on the 233 degree radial. This isn't a lead radial. The lead radial is right here. It's published at 240. There's one on the opposite arc for 225. But the end of the arc is at 233, which also happens to be the Matui fix. Let's just take five miles on that, so or five degrees on that, going this way. So add five to 233, you get 238. And so now, all of a sudden, you've led that in. Now, if you look at this, the guidance you get in the lower left corner of your HSI, if you're flying one of the newer eight, uh, glass panel aircraft, that's a bearing. It's not a radial. So now we gotta switch these numbers around. Everybody likes reciprocals. So we'll swap 233, and that's 053. And if you factor in your five degrees of lead, you're gonna start your lead in a sloppy looking 58 degree bearing in. So if you're flying an HSI unit, you can just wait till that says OTH 058. That will give you about a 1.25 mile lead based on your 120 knot ground speed in this example, it should lead you on perfectly. So why don't we just use a lead radial? And the answer to that, most lead radials are built for aircraft that are moving much faster than ours. In the SR-22 Turbo, we fly the initial procedure at 120 knots indicated. Down at sea level, that's about 120 knots true. Up here in Colorado, it's a little faster. And even the published lead radials are typically way too far out for us. So I could turn and take an intercept heading, but it really doesn't lead to a smooth turn on to the arc. And I like to try to do a smooth turn on. That's how we were taught. And at the end of the day, it's not too complicated. And the mental math to figure out a lead radial really isn't that hard, especially once you do it a few times and you typically have time on the arc to figure it out. If you don't like the mental math, it's easy to figure out on a calculator. So that's how you figure out and use a lead radial. Let's watch that turn on. So as we go to the iPad, I'll hit play and you can see we're basically watching until this here gets to the 058 bearing inbound. Oh, I paused it. And I'm continuing to fly the arc as normal. And as I approach the 058 bearing, boom, that's it. I'll smoothly tar start my turn on. And the advantage, arcing two, I don't have to spin my HSI far to join the localizer. Keep in mind, typically, if you're arcing, your HSI is set to a VOR, so you would need to switch to your other nav radio um, or swap the localizer frequency in. And now I'm done with the arc and flying in. Look at that turn on. Okay, so that's how you fly an arc and no end. Let's rewind, there's one more thing I want you to see in here because it really is, a, uh, it's very useful. We'll take a look at it in the future um, again, but let's watch us fly this segment and I want you to watch this bearing pointer here. It's the light blue line that you can see. Most glass cockpit aircraft uh, have at least, they have two of them typically. And so right now you can see it's, it's that cyan color. I've got it tied to the VOR. Watch what's happening. It's swinging its way from five degrees above my wing to five degrees below. I'm doing a 10 degree arc and just watch it. It's just gonna sit there and swing five degrees up to five degrees down. 
okay, five degrees up to five degrees down. And in a no wind scenario, that's going to happen right off your wing. Your left wing, if you're arcing to the left, your right wing, if you're arcing to the right. Okay, looks like we got a question. Okay, first question here is from Jonathan, and that is uh, with these uh, lead radials. He says, can you use the heading bug to mark the lead inbound radial? And just keep turning the OBS as you fly through the radials. Absolutely. Um, it's a great idea. In fact, we use the heading bug here uh, because we built that animation system and it turns based off the heading bug. Uh, but when I'm actually flying the arc, the reality is I'll put the heading bug in a lot of different places. Mark the lead radial, mark my wing correction angle. There's a lot of different things you can do with it. But it's a great idea, once you've computed your lead radial, to put something there and mark it. And if you maybe if you're doing a long arc and you've got a lot of wind and you're having a hard time kind of keeping track of where you are, or you're using the autopilot to fly heading mode on the airplane, what you can do is kind of switch that at the end. Um, but it, that's a great idea is to mark that lead radial. You know, and again, you can oftentimes predict your ground speed at the end of the arc, and this isn't perfect science. I typically start my turn a little earlier as opposed to a little later, so I'll take the larger lead radial in my calculations. But taking time to figure out your lead radial before you're on the arc or if you're on a lo on long arc well before you're at the end, it really makes life a lot easier. Okay, let's take a look at what would happen if we're off the arc, because not all arc arcs are perfect especially if I'm the one flying them. So let's take a look at corrections without wind. We'll jump into the iPad here. I'm going to clear the drawing out. And what you can see is, first of all, our heading looks about right. I'm flying a perpendicular arc. Um, and I told you in, in that ground track indicator, it's about perpendicular. That tells us we're doing something right. But the distance, the 17 DME, lets me know that I'm off. And if I continue to fly this segment, it's not closing in at all. So I guess it closed in a little bit there, but not much. If I continue to fly this, first of all, you'll see if I was to stick on that heading, the arc's moving away from me. I'm not going to get closer. So it's clear that I need to do something to intercept this arc. So I'm going to take about a 30 degree intercept heading. I'm going to turn towards the arc. So if I'm arcing left, I'm going to turn left to pick an intercept on the arc. So here comes that turn. Look at that. Now I'm turning. Okay, so as I fly that intercept, I'm still twisting my CDIs. But what you've noticed is my no intercept heading would be over here. I've taken an intercept heading towards the inside of the arc. And I know I'm doing it right if that distance starts to shrink down. So from there, I'm going to continue to fly that in. And I'll continue to spin the CDI as necessary until that distance is just about to 16 DME. At that point in time, I'm going to take the correction back out. And that's where it's good to remember what, your, you know, what heading you were using to maintain the arc. Um, and we'll talk about wind in a second. But I need to remember to take it out. One of the biggest errors with an arc is that people turn the intercept and end up flying through it. So boom, now I take it out. And what I'm going to do is monitor to make sure that that distance doesn't change. That's a pretty typical scenario if you start your turn too early and you misjudge your ground speed or you miscompute your lead in and you end up doing that 90 degree turn, you roll out, you're on the arc and you're like, wow, I'm still a mile out. And so that's a great way to correct there. Okay, so let's look at the opposite situation. Lead radial was way too, um, way too, or your lead distance was way too short and you ended up somewhere inside the arc. So we'll go back to the iPad. There we are, now we're inside the arc. We could tell we're inside the arc because my DME is, is too close, 14.4 DME, so I'm about a mile and uh, 1.6 miles inside the arc. Just looking at my ground track indicator on my HSI and my HSI RMI, I feel like I'm actually holding that arc. It's just that I'm too far inside. So what I'm going to do is take an intercept heading away from the arc. Now, the interesting thing about this is if I just hold this heading, eventually I'm going to fly myself right back onto the arc. And that's the interesting thing when you're correcting on an arc. If you're outside the arc, you definitely need to take a turn towards the arc and generally a fairly, a decent intercept angle because the arc is moving away from you as you fly. On the other hand, if you're on the inside of an arc, you can typically just keep going straight and eventually you'll end up flying yourself back into the arc. 
So inside corrections can be much smaller than outside corrections. And big common areas, if you're outside the arc, you're not taking much of an intercept angle. You keep forgetting the arc is turning away from you. Or inside, people will take a 45 degree intercept and you blow right through that arc. So inside corrections are small, outside corrections need to be big. And so you'll see here, I think I'm doing like a 20 degree intercept on the iPad. I'm gonna to turn to do my intercept. I'm turning inside the arc. And if you look at that, you can tell, okay, we know I'm inside because my normal perpendicular arc heading is here. I've actually turned quite a bit in this case, um, but I'm turning essentially away from the arc. I'm sorry, I'm turning towards the outside. And now I'm going to allow that to fly myself on. When you're doing this, you need to really watch that distance because it typically will close in much faster when I'm intercepting the arc from the inside and then take out that correction and keep flying the arc. Okay, so let's take a look at wind. The interesting thing about flying an arc in wind is that typically on a long arc, um, 100 degree arc or longer, your wind correction angle is going to completely change. And that's because you know what starts as a crosswind after 90 degrees is going to be a headwind or a tailwind. So unlike flying a final approach course or an airway, your wind correction angles along an arc are constantly changing. You really have to be paying attention to them. Now, modern aircraft, you've got a wind vector oftentimes on a glass panel or a GPS-driven aircraft. Um, and so even if you're manually flying the arc, uh, you oftentimes have some indication of where the wind is coming from. If you don't have an actual wind indicator, the winds aloft are really, really helpful. And then you just kind of use what you're seeing to calibrate where that wind's coming from. But the key thing to remember when you're correcting along an arc is that your wind correction angle is constantly changing. So after you've moved, you know, maybe 10 degrees or 20 degrees of arc, think about, okay, what am I holding? How much wind correction do I have in? Should I be taking some out or adding some more? You know, you should be able to logically predict what's going to happen to that wind correction angle. Looks like we have a question. We do, and I'm just going to hop in here. Real I was quick fast on the trigger there, wasn't I? <laughs> no, we, I'm just going to hop right in here because we've actually had this uh, pop up a few times here. People are asking, Alex, if you can go back to the, uh, the turn on, people are asking, um, what's the difference between 233, which uh, looks like the radial at Matui, and 226, which I believe is the, the lead localizer. Yeah, let's radial, take a look at that. I'm going to go to 226. I'm going to go to four flight. That'll make that a little bit easier to see. So um, I'm going to clear this out too. Yeah, right okay. There. I can see the, the 226 on the localizer, 233 off the OTH. Yes. So this is a great example of uh, a, a procedure where the VOR is not located where the localizer is. Um, so you can see the VOR is off to the side, and I'm going to switch that over. There's my localizer course. So the inbound radial of 233 isn't going to line up with the localizer course. They're two completely different courses. And that actually happens more often than people think. There's a lot of airports where the VOR is off field, but still used for an arc. And that's why we chose that here. So you really want to be careful when you're trying to figure out what your inbound course is. We know what our inbound course is because it's published right here. And if we take a look down here, this is a FAA plate. You'll see it right there. Um, if we look at the Jepson plate, I actually think they're a, a little bit simpler. Um, what they don't publish is the end of the arc here, um, but you can see here the inbound course is 046. So that's why those two are different. Uh, and it's something to be careful about because always look for the VOR, and especially if you're flying a low course in a VOR, even if they're on the field, they may not be the inbound, that final radial, the arc, may not necessarily be the localizer course. Plus, um, you could also find those numbers are different because the declination of the VOR, that's an IFR term for you, a uh, declination is the variation that was programmed in, but it's set. It doesn't get, it gets updated, but not very often. Um, that oftentimes does not match the magnetic variation in the area, so you could find those two numbers are different. So when we're looking at turning inbound and flying the localizer, you want to look at what that inbound localizer number is. Do not tie that with the outbound radial that terminates the arc. The two are completely different, even if they happen to be very, very close to each other. Colin, you think that was a good job there? I think that was perfect, yeah. Good, I'm really perfect. Okay, so let's take a look. Um, 
We talked about correcting inbound and outbound. Let's take a look at what happens with wind. So I'm gonna pull up an HSI. And we're gonna take a look at HSI flying with wind. So I'm gonna pause this. And we're gonna clear this. And we got the same wind we had at the very beginning. 165 degrees magnetic at 30 knots. Okay, so if you think about that, 165, it's basically coming down the pipe there almost. And so I'm flying in at a much slower ground speed, 92 knots. So if we work this out, 92 knots equals a 0.9 lead. Okay, so we're flying that 16 DME arc. So we'll start our turn at 16.9. And I will fast forward it just a little bit to get us in there. Okay, so boom, 16.9. I'm going to twist my CDI to full scale and turn 90 degrees, but not quite. I'm going to take an estimated wind correction angle. I know the wind's coming from this direction. And if you look at the HSI, it's basically blowing right off my wing here. So I need to turn into the wind, okay? The wind's coming from here. This is the rough no wind heading. So you've noticed I've taken a heading bug into the wind. There's really no great rule of thumb for this. It comes from experience and knowing based off ground speeds, kind of what your angle is. I'm sure you could mathematically compute it, the GPS does. But really when we're flying, it just comes from experience. In fact, um, my first instructor called it Kentucky windage. So it's something that you get when you fly a lot. And this is why practicing these arcs with different kinds of wind, flight simulator, even if you just put it completely on altitude lock and just spin the heading bug around, it's a great way to learn with different winds and different airspeeds. But if we go back to the iPad, you can see that I've taken uh, about a 15 degree, we'll keep playing this out, about a 15 degree angle into the wind. And it seems to be keeping me on course. And the reason we know this is, that's not the color I wanted. The reason we know this is that I'm still at 16.0 nautical miles. And if we were flying a typical D or a old school DME unit, the DME distance or DME ground speed would say zero. That means I'm holding the arc, so I'm doing, doing that right. Again, another way to cheat, if I was to look at my bearing pointer and my ground track indicator, if you're flying with a GPS driven aircraft, they are perpendicular. That means that my ground track is tangential to the arc. It's keeping me right on the arc. So if that distance lines up with the arc and I see that T right there between my ground track indicator and my bearing pointer, I am dead on that arc. Okay, so we'll clear that out. Right now you can see I've got about a 14, it's more, it's probably 16 degree wind correction angle. But I know that as I go around the arc, that's gonna start to change. Actually, one more thing to think about. If you look at this as your left wing, okay, and, and you look at where the HSI and the bearing indicator is pointing, this makes sense. Because if your VOR is down here, and that's the radial, yeah, sorry, that was really rough. We'll try that again. And that's the radial we're flying. Look at where it's cutting through the airplane. It's between the nose and the wing. It's somewhere between the nose and the wing. And if we look at that bearing pointer right there, it's between the nose and the left wing. So if you visualize how you've turned in towards the VOR, you're seeing exactly that from your bearing pointer. This is why flying, with an, uh, flying an arc with a bearing pointer is so easy once you get used to it. it. You just visualize where the wind's coming from and it makes a cake. So we're doing our twist 10, turn 10. We're right on the arc. We know that because it's staying right at 16. And what you can see is as we start to move our way around, we're turning into a headwind. And you can see our ground speed is starting to slow down. As we do that, we're going to need less and less of a wind correction angle. So each time we turn 10 degrees, we're thinking about, okay, do I need to adjust my wind correction angle in what direction? So if we look at it now, that wind correction angle is starting to come around. Let's pause it here and delete it. And, you know, it looks like if that's kind of our no end, we're probably about 12 degrees, which makes sense. We're coming into a headwind. But we know that we're on the arc because that distance isn't changing at all. And again, flying an arc, the key thing is you're turning 10 degrees every time. 
Okay, you do that nine times, and now you've moved from a crosswind to a headwind. So every time you're turning, you should be thinking about what do I need to do with WCA? Does it need to be, do I need more of a wind correction angle or do I need a smaller wind correction angle? Okay, we're gonna keep moving this down. Uh, I'll move it, fast forward it to the point where we're about ready to turn on. We'll talk about that turn on again. So here we are, we're closing in and I'm gonna look at my ground speed, 90 knots. So I'm talking about a 0.9 nautical mile lead in. And we know based off this 16 degree, 16 DME arc, okay, that's basically we could say 15 equals four degrees per mile. So maybe we start our turn four degrees out. So we're at the 233, you add four to that, you get 237, okay, or 057 bearing to the station. So as we start to move in, I'm waiting for this guy to get to 057 or the tail to get to 237 of the bearing pointer. And that's it. And I'll start my turn in. And that's how I lead the arc inbound. Okay, let's talk about correcting for wind because, oh, looks like we have a question. So we'll start with that. Okay, and the, uh, the correction uh, can or cannot uh, have to do with wind here. Uh, it comes from Ed and he says, uh, I think this is a good example of if you're inside the arc mm -hmm. and you're trying to get yourself back. Uh, what he says is, would it be wrong to take out half of your correction angle to get yourself back on the arc? That's a great rule of thumb. In fact, one of the things to keep in mind is your, your correction doesn't need to be instantaneous. I think the biggest mistake we make when we're flying is we see we're off course and you get, you know, kind of this, oh man, I got to fix that, which you do, but you don't have to fix it right away, okay? You're, you're, especially if you're still within the protected areas, you need to fix it in a way that you can join the course. So if your wind correction, if you're inside the arc and your wind correction angle into the arc is, you think, maybe too much, taking out half is great. The cool thing that you can do with that is you can start to see what's happening to your DME distance. So if your DME distance starts creeping its way back up to 16, then once you get to 16, maybe add in half of that. Okay, so you took out half, so, so add a half of that in. So now you've got you know, a quarter less wind correction and see if that holds the arc. Part of the key with flying an arc and changing headings is knowing what you've used and what it's done to your distance. And so, you know, and then measuring it. So, okay, let's try this. Is my distance moving out or in, faster or slower? And then once you find yourself back on the arc, just make a judgment call to turn yourself on. You'll find, especially with most arcs you find as initial approach arcs and stuff, you know, 10 DME arcs, um, it's very controllable. You'll have lots of time. It might go from 10 to 10.1. 10.2, you know, or fairly slowly. And remember, you've got about a mile. I think your, your PTS tolerance, your ACS tolerances are a mile. So being 0.1 off the arc, you know, that's not bad. That's called bracketing. Looks like we had another question. Okay, I'm going to hop in here, and I, I know I'm jumping ahead just a little bit, but this has been popping up a few times, so I want to get on it. Uh, and this is from CB. He says, on a CDI, no HSI, but on a, uh, on a CDI, how do you know which way to twist the CDI and should you be flying this with a from indication or a to indication? I know, Alex, you've got a, an animation on this uh, too. So uh, take it from there. <laughs> I don't think we've got an animation of a pure CDI. So you lied a little oh. bit there. <laughs> but Sorry about I that. I can explain it. I can explain <laughs> it. That's the way I learned to arc. Um, and and uh, for space, we just drew an HSI. Um, but let's take a look at that. Actually, I'm going to spin up for flight. We're going to draw that. Um, we'll work on an animation. When we finally get our instrument course done, there'll be VOR CDI animations in there. Uh, but let's start by just drawing out a traditional CDI. Okay, and I'm gonna draw it with a swinging arc. So one of those needles that are kind of attached at the top. First of all, I always arc um, two. So if I'm, let's say this is the VOR and I'm arcing this way, and this is the, we'll just say the zero degree radial, I'm gonna arc with 180 at the top. 
There's a couple of advantages there. Number one is once I get myself all the way around and I'm ready to turn on the localizer, it's a 90 degree, 90 degree spin of the arc to get myself centered back up. But there's another saying that you can remember, um, arc left, swing left, arc right, swing right. That's true if you're using a two bearing at the top. So when we say arc right or arc left, swing left, and I'm gonna, let's see if I can clear that out and just kind of make this a little bit cleaner. Okay, so if you think about arc left, swing left, this is a counterclockwise arc. Okay, so this is a left arc. Okay, what that means is if I move this forward from 180 to 170, so this now goes to 170, the needle will start out here and swing itself to the left. So you'll see it go here, and it goes left. Then you move it to 160, it goes here, and it goes left. If you're doing the opposite arc, if you're arcing to the right, so that's a 270 radial, 0, 9, 0, arc right, swing right. The needle will move itself to the right. So that's my principle. That being said, whatever way works for you. Uh, initially, when I started learning, I arced with the tail so I knew which radial I was on. I thought that worked better. I didn't have to do the flipping numbers in my, in my head as I'm looking at an approach plate. But the swinging thing is easier to remember and, and the twisting on to final worked out better for me, so I chose to arc with the two. If you arc with the from, you just re reverse that. Um, but that's a great way to do it with a CDI. And one of the things to keep in mind is arcing with a CDI and an HSI are really the exact same thing. Yes, on an HSI, you can see yourself fly through the radial. That's helpful, okay? But if you bring your CDI out, so it's just at the edge, maybe not all the way to the edge, but just at the edge, you can see, you know, if you swung it the wrong direction, it's gonna move further away. Otherwise, you're gonna watch it swing through the center. And that's the key thing with an arc. You're just swinging it through the center. Whether you're swinging it right or left, you're just doing 10 degree, or some people do five degree, halfway to halfway arc segments. You're good to go. Okay, looks like we have another question. Okay, next up, this is from Carlos, and he says, uh, do you notice any difference flying a DME arc using a VOR versus using the GPS? Uh, and in your opinion, which one is better? Great question. Uh, absolutely. DME with the GPS is cake. Uh, that's the easiest way to use it. Now, when we're talking about distance sources, they're the same. Um, whether I'm using DME to supply my distance or GPS to supply my distance, you're so far out, slant range is negligible, you really can't tell a difference. That being said, uh, DME is getting kind of hard to come by. Um, if you've got an aircraft with a, a, a G1000 or you know, like a newer system, you, you look at what a lot of schools are using, new 172s and, and uh, diamonds and, and SR20s and 22s, you don't find a lot of DME units. Um, and so you typically have to find an older aircraft, but, but don't be afraid of them because honestly, arcing with a DME, the distance is the exact same. Um, if you've flown with a DME unit, some of you might be thinking about the fact that you have to remember to hit hold. And that's because a DME is a completely separate radio than, than your VOR. So as long as your CDI is on your VOR and your DME is on your VOR, um, you're fine. Um, but if you were to switch your CDI off to maybe your localizer and use a hard bearing pointer, like a mechanical bearing pointer, you typically have to hit a hold button on the DME to tell it, okay, don't keep the DME radio that you had programmed, just switch the, the VHF over to, or the, the um, needle itself over to the localizer. Um, but other than that, the distance information is the same. That being said, if I actually uh, am looking to reduce workload, I'm going to let GPS navigate the arc um, all the time. Looks like we have another question. Okay, this one uh, from Rodstein. What about using an RMI on the arc? Okay, so let's take a look at that. Um, let's jump into that right now, actually. I've got this, a great... by the way, is the animation I was talking That's about That's the earlier. animation you were looking for. We got for. it right now. I was... So this is how I actually fly. If I'm flying an arc, this is how I'm going to fly an arc. We'll jump into the iPad. Let's start with the no-wind arc. Okay, I'm going to speed my way along. Um, we'll just join the arc right here as we've turned on, okay? Notice what I've done in this scenario is I've already tied 
my CDI to my 046 inbound course. It's hooked up here on the localizer. So it's all ready to go. And all I'm going to do is use my RMI or bearing pointer. Um, RMI uh, stands for Remote Magnetic Indicator or Radio Magnetic Indicator. Um, and basically it's just showing you where the facility is off your wing. So it's over here somewhere. By the way, uh, if anybody wants to know what it's like to fly with an ADF, and you're flying an airplane with an RMI or a bearing pointer, and you're like, man, I always wanted to see what it's like to fly an NDB approach. Well, fly a VOR approach using the bearing indicator. Um, and that's what it's like flying an NDB approach. It's just that on most training airplanes, our NDB indicators didn't automatically adjust for heading. They just stayed fixed at zero. So you could either try to manually spin it, which was a pain in the butt, or just kind of transpose it visually, which took a little bit of practice. But using an RMI, it just, it just points to the station. It tells you what radio you're on and it points to the station. So we'll go back to the iPad here. And what you can see is, I kind of talked about this before, but we're just gonna let the RMI fly from five degrees up to five degrees back. And that gives us a 10 degree arc segment. And I'm basically keeping in a no wind scenario that middle value perpendicular to my heading. That's it. So if you have a mechanical RMI, um, we had one in the Baron that we flew, and the Seminoles had them. Um, you would just keep, in a no-wind scenario, you would just keep essentially your centered RMI position right there. And you just keep moving it inside the wing to outside the wing. Okay, so let's take a look at an RMI in wind. And again, whether you're flying with a mechanical RMI or a digital bearing pointer on a, on a glass cockpit or an EFIS or, you know, glass cockpit aircraft, the principles are the exact same. The only distance, difference is on a mechanical RMI HSI combo or a side RMI that you might have off on the side, um, you don't necessarily um, have a ground track indicator. So there's no predictor there, so you can't quite visualize that, but you just have to kind of visualize your wind correction angle. So let's go in, we've got some wind. Uh, looking at the iPad, the wind again is at a 165 at 30 to keep this all standardized. So we know it's coming out of there and I'm gonna jump in and we'll get actually on it. You can see what's happening. I'll actually go one radio in. Okay, so if you look at what's going on, my RMI is opposed to bracketing around the wing it's now just bracketing a little bit up here. And that's because if you think about where the station is, your wind correction angle has turned your state or has turned your aircraft. So the station, the VOR is now in between the nose and the wing. So you're going to do the same bracketing right here. Okay. It's just that you've got your wind correction angle factored in and you want to keep track of this kind of transpose a line. If you're doing this on a mechanical system and figure out, okay, yeah, it looks like I'm holding about a 17 degree wind correction angle. See if that works. See if that holds that distance constant. And if it does, you're good to go. If it doesn't add a little bit to that wind correction angle, this is really easy though, because it's, it's very easy once you practice to just visualize that kind of no wind line and then factor in your turn into the wind. Again, the wind's here out of the south, so we're turning the aircraft into the wind. And what you could see there is I'm doing these little 10-degree uh, turns. With an RMI, you don't even have to do a 10-degree turn. Uh, you can just do tiny little constant adjustments and, and as opposed to doing the 10-degree turn. Um, a lot of aircraft that have traditional RMIs, either where they're integrated with an HSI or it's a separate unit, but it's still a compass driven card. They typically have autopilot systems, at least with heading holds. And you see a lot of people set it up on heading and just kind of keep moving that heading bug to, to keep that RMI and their wind correction angle perpendicular and you just fly it around. Okay, looks like we had another question. Okay, next up, this has to do with the turn on of this approach that we're looking at. Mm -hmm. Jeff wants to know, when you're arcing on a VOR that's off field, like what we have here uh, at the airport, What's the correct point to manage your alignment on final? Basically, how do you manage your turn on and switch over from the VOR and align yourself with the localizer on this particular arc? Okay, so let's take a look at the plate, um, the chart, the appropriate name for it, and um, you'll be able to see that. So what you can do there 
I'm actually going to go today. We're going to use this. Okay. What you can do there, the, the interesting thing um, is it really doesn't make a difference if the two are co-located or not. What you really just want to figure out is where are the arc ends and then work out your distance like we talked about. So if I know I'm going, let's just say I've got a um, 100 knot ground speed. Okay. I'm going to lead by one mile and I know that I've got a 16 degree arc. So that one mile is going to be, um, remember it, 16 is roughly the same as 15. So four, that was a horrible four, four degrees per mile. So I'm just going to lead by four degrees. Let's look at a different approach. Um, let's look at, well, let's go to, um, Durango. And look at their ILS. Okay. So Durango's got an ILS uh, that where the VOR is basically located at the same point. So you can see, again, the 027 course inbound here is not a radial. That's a localizer course. Um, but it is on this, the 018, which would be the um, 198. Right? And so how would you know when you're going to lead in? So let's hit clear and take a look. So let's say I'm going um, 120 knots. So I'm going to lead a 90 degree turn by 1.2 miles. 14 DME arc. Again, it's really close to 15. So I'd lead by 5 degrees at 120 knot ground speed. So take 198 and add five to that, um, which would be 203. And that would be my, my personal lead radial. One of the other things to think about when you're choosing that, normally our turns off arcs are 90 degrees. And normally our turns on arcs are 90 degrees. If you're be using the arc as your initial approach segment, then you need to intercept the arc at the initial approach fix. You can't join the arc somewhere in the middle. You actually have to pick it up at the IAF and then fly the arc around. Um, and so normally, if you're doing that and you're not using GPS to navigate, you're stuck on a VOR airway or uh, a Victor airway or a VOR radial, you're going to make a 90 degree turn and then you're going to make another 90 degree turn on final. If you're not making a 90 degree turn, if it's less, you just kind of spitball a, a shorter lead. So maybe as opposed to one mile, you'll do 0.8. But it at that point in time comes back down, as I said, Kentucky windage and experience. Okay, we have another question. Okay, we got time for one last question here, and we're going to JB, uh, and back to using the GPS for the arc. Uh, the first animation is probably a, a good example here, and that is when you're using the GPS uncoupled, um, so you, you're not coupled to an autopilot, do you recommend using the cross-track function, if you have one, uh, to manually fly your arc? That's a good question. Uh, it, you know, it really depends on the... It really depends on the capabilities of your airplane and, and how your GPS is set up. Typically, um, with a GPS-driven system, I'm actually going to tie the GPS to my CDI because for most of them, like most of the Garmin units, even the 430s, which are 20 years old, I think now, um, they'll navigate you along that arc by keeping the CDI centered. Um, so that, to me, I mean, if I'm actually flying it in a, in a production world, Production meaning I'm actually out there in IMC. That's how I'll typically do it. But you could absolutely use cross track as well. One of the key things to flying an arc um, or navigating anyway in IMC is there are many ways to accomplish the same task. Um, it, it, to, to put this into perspective, um, I was flying on an airline. I was flying a, flying on Delta right after Northwest and Delta had merged, and. I was sitting next to a couple of pilots and they both flew the 757. Um, they were both Northwest guys and they had just adopted Delta procedures. And like, oh man, those Delta procedures are all wrong. That's the first thing we like to say as pilots. Man, if that's not the way I do it, it is all wrong. It, these were really nice guys and they weren't that frustrated about it. But you get so used to doing something your way that that's the right way to do it. And the reality is as long as it's legally correct and it's, you're using the avionics in the way they were meant to be used, and you're tuned to the right nav source, which means on an ARC, GPS is a fine nav source. On a localizer, you need to be tied to the actual VHF system. But if it works for you, then it's a great way to fly. 
And one of the interesting things you'll see is the more you fly, you start to pick up ideas from other pilots. Like as I said, when I use CDIs, I started by spinning it with a from radial. Colin's the one who was using the two radial. I eventually changed over. So, you know, it, it's, it really depends on what works for you. So cross track, absolutely you can do that. Typically when I'm flying GPS, I'm just gonna center it up um, by letting the GPS navigate the arc and I'm gonna fly it around in a circle um, and that's how I'm gonna do it. But Okay, so that's all the time we have tonight. There's a couple closing up things. Uh, number one, there is a link in the description so that you can tell us what your ideas are for the next time. So in two weeks, we'll do another one of these. Uh, we, the, the DME system or the DME discussion came specifically from uh, reader comments uh, or, or audience comments last time. So use that link to tell us what you'd like to hear about in two weeks. Also, let us know how you think we did. Um, I really appreciate the feedback. We've been changing things up based off your feedback. So continue to give us good feedback. Um, and then tomorrow, if you go to, go to boldmethod.com slash live, tomorrow night's show is, um, we call it career prep, but if you're an instrument pilot, this one's going to apply to you as well. It's takeoff and alternate minimums and the differences between FAA and Jepson procedures. So if you're getting ready for an interview, if you're going to an airline or a charter company, again, you're going to be using Jepson procedures. You probably grew up on FAA procedures or if you're or military, a lot of military pilots have never seen a Jepson procedure because they use the TPPs of the FAA documents. And, and so therefore, or DOD charts. So they've never seen JEP. Um, so tomorrow night, um, same time as this broadcast, you're going to see basically how to determine takeoff, alternate minimums, and ODPs on Jepson versus FAA. So you'll get an idea of the two. And um, again, I'll, you'll see why I prefer Jepson, though you can use either one. Thanks for tuning in. Have a great night.